Jesus said that he's alive. Because he lives, he can live also. He says that he's alive forevermore. Yes. He had the keys of death and hell. That's right. He said all power he in heaven and earth have been given unto him. Yeah. He said he told us to go therefore and teach all nations, <laughs> baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Son and the Holy Ghost, That's teaching right. them to observe what's all things whatsoever I have commanded you. Hmm. And then he said, Lo, I'm with you. Always, even unto the end of the age. Yes. Hallelujah. So he's with us today. Yes. Mm. The Holy Spirit is is is, is, is came to walk with us. Mm. He never leave us nor forsake us. Oh. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Thank God for grace. I'm here this morning by God's grace and by His power, by His might, and thank God for everything that He has done in my life and that what He is going to do. Uh, in the next couple of weeks or months, I'm going to be embarking on a series of teaching about, upon doctrine, okay. doctrinal truths of the Bible, because I, I, I know and I reckon that it's not spoken of uh, in much detail. There are a lot of preachers and teachers that in the past taught doctrinal truths, and they have left vast resources of material both visual, audio and written for our help and and, and our 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 guide. I'm reminded of the Bible that God called the apostles and it's a holy man of God wrote the Bible as they were moved and inspired by the Holy Ghost. That's right. Mm -hmm. And he called some apostles, he called some prophets. Ephesians speaks about this. But there's a truth that we overlook that the apostles had a personal experience with, the, with Christ. They were with him from the beginning until his death and resurrection. They, were, they could give a testimony of, of him, of his lifestyle on earth. And when we look at the New Testament, we have the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. We have the book of Acts. We have the epistles written by Mostly written by the Apostle Paul, and Peter himself wrote two epistles. We have the epistle written by James, and we have the book of Revelation. Hallelujah. Amen. And John himself, the Apostle John, wrote also three epistles in the New Testament. But most of the New Testament is, is, is written by Paul. And Paul called himself the Apostle that was like least among among the others the one that was called out of time and even though these men are dead they are still apostles in the church today mm -hmm. we're going to say how, how is that how is that possible because when we look at genesis and also hebrews genesis 4 8 and hebrews chapter 11 and also hebrews chapter 12 the bible speaks of abel that was killed by his brother. And he says, even though he's dead, mm -hmm. he ex still is speaking. So even though the apostles are dead, they are still speaking the word of God to our hearts through the written scriptures. Amen. Mm -hmm. So Amen. let me read Peter. Let me read the apostle Paul writing. John. Let me read James. Let me read Jude. They are speaking to our hearts the same word. The word of God is never dead. It's, in fact, the word of God is alive. Praise the Lord. It's alive forevermore. Hallelujah. You know, we, we, we hear about the living constitution, the American constitution. It might be living to man, but it's not living to God. Hmm. The, the constitution is not infallible. There, there, there are over 27 amendments in the constitution <laughs> proving that in its original form, it wasn't perfect. They had to make amendments. Yes. They had to make corrections. They had to make additions. But the word of God is infallible. Mm. 
Mm -hmm. It is his truth. It is a truth and the wisdom and the knowledge of God and the power of God in, in that existence. And, it, and, it's, and it's a life forevermore. It, it, it's the only document, the Bible, is the only document that we can see is a lie, is living. The word of God is living. Amen. If, in fact, it says that it, 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 it can go and separate between the giants and the morrow. Mm hmm into the spirit and the soul. That's right. It, 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 it's quick. It's alive then, quick. Oh, it cuts and it separates and it can put back together. So we're going to be dealing with some doctrines. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Well, we're going to start, we're going to start our introduction today and we're going to see how far we get. Okay. But introduction is taken from Hebrews 6, verses 1 to 3. Now this is Paul was speaking. And he made a, a very poignant statement that we got to consider. He says, Therefore, leaving the discussions of the elementary principles of Christ, let us go on to perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works, and of faith towards God, of the doctrine of baptisms, of laying on, of, on, hands, laying on of hands, of resurrection of the dead, and of eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permits. Paul made a statement that we have to go on beyond the elementary teaching about the Bible. Or the elementary teaching about the things of God. Once you have come to acknowledge the truth, you need a more in-depth revelation of God. You need to study. You need to know His principles and His truth. We, you need to know the doctrines of the, the Bible, the various doctrines. There's no, there's no need for us to be contending and arguing about baptism, laying out of hands, the resurrection of the dead. Those are, are the elementary points of, of Christianity, of, of, the, of the faith. Paul said we must go on, be, be, go on beyond that. And we must get into solid, deep, concentrating, Thinking and understanding of the word of God. So, what is salvation? You might ask me. What is the point of the Bible? Or what is the purpose of the Bible? Salvation is one word. But it is a many-sided word. It gathers unto itself all of the redemptive acts and processes of God. Salvation is... Is, is a total and complete work of God. It is a total and complete work of God. Like God, it is eternal in nature. Instituted and bestowed solely by the sovereign will of God or the Godhead. All three parties of the God of the Godhead operates in and bring about salvation of man. All three of them agree and have a part to play. And they all help each other, or they all confirm, or they all support various aspects of salvation. Each person of the Godhead agree together. There's one mind, there's one will of God. But specific persons play some part personally. God the Father is the originating cause. The Father, God, He is what originates salvation. Salvation originates with Him. God the Son is the meritorious cause or the mediatorial cause. It means that Jesus Christ was made mediator. He's the mediator between God and man. He's the one that is actually not going to die and to bring about the plan of salvation. He's the one that is actually going to put God's plan into effect by his work, by his doing, by, by him laying down his life, a ransom for many. So that's why we use the word meritorious. His work has merit. It has it have cause. It has... I, 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 I will use the term, it can bring about a change, a result. It can bring about an effect. It is not the cause, but it is a, an, an effect. Because God the Father is the cause. But Jesus is the effect of the Father's plan being put into operation. And God the Holy Spirit is efficient or uh, the 
uh, communicating cards. Efficient means expert, done concisely, done correctly, done, done precisely. But the Holy Spirit, he's the one that communicates the work of Jesus to sinners. He's the one that brings about the change, the actual change, or take the work of Jesus, his death, his resurrection, his sacrificial blood that was shed, and apply it to the sinner. That's why we use the word communicate. If we look at um, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, I'm sorry, 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 14, we see a statement made that the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship, uh, we can use the word communion, of the Holy Spirit be with us all, now and forevermore. Amen. So we see the three parties of the Godhead being mentioned. And, and this is, the, is one of the only scriptures where you will see the Son mentioned before the Father. Normally it's the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But we see that in, in 2 Corinthians 13, verse 14, it says the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. So grace and truth comes through Jesus Christ. But God the Father, He's the source of all love. So he said, the love of God. He just takes the love of God and he gives it to us. Hallelujah. Amen. The Bible, which is the word of God, reveals God's plan and purpose in the matter of salvation. The Bible is the only medium or the only method or the only way that God spoke. And it's the only, it's the only tool or it's the only written document that can present the plan of salvation. It's the only book. There's no other way. There's no other name given about me whereby we can be seen. There's no other gospel than the word of God that can bring salvation. Hmm. Paul said, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. God is the power of God unto salvation to them that believe, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Hmm. When we speak of the Bible, we're talking about both the Old and the New Testament. The New Testament cannot exist without the old. And the old cannot exist without the new. Because there must be an unfolding of the old and the new. There must be a revelation of the old and the new. The new is, is, is bringing about what God spoke in the past. It's putting into action what God planned and his purpose was for mankind. Hallelujah. Amen. The Bible is only written complete revelation to man. It is also doctrinal in nature. Doctrine, teaching, hallelujah, Be making plain, bringing to understanding, revealing, explaining, determining. We can use, even use the word consulting, bringing together into one package God's plan. So we need doctrine. We need to be taught. We need to be, we need understanding. We need wisdom and knowledge in the things of God. So doctrine teaches. Doctrine reveals. Doctrine explains the truth of God to us. Hallelujah. Amen. There is one biblical doctrine. There's only one doctrine. The doctrine of salvation. The doctrine of God. If you want to say the doctrine of Jesus Christ. The doctrine of God. Jesus and Him crucified. But... This one doctrine can be broken down into individual parts. Like the body is one, but have many members. So a doctrine is one, but also have many parts. You can separate them and break them down so that you can now deal with each individual part, explain it, expound it, pre-teach it, to bring understanding, and then it, what happens, it come back together as one body, as one. You cannot separate doctrine and, and, and cause or bring about a change in a man. Each one relies upon each, on, on the, on, on each aspect relies upon the other aspect. Because one supposes or presupposes another. Hallelujah. Amen. The Bible, which is the word of God, reveals this plan. But in the matter of salvation, 
we will, by God's grace, deal with some of the various doctrines that in totality make up God's redemptive acts and processes. As we mentioned before, salvation is a many-sided word. Many-sided. That gathers unto itself all the redemptive acts and processes of God. Salvation involves both act and process. An act is something that is done once or instantaneously. A process is revealed or evolved over time. So, some of God's works are once. He was crucified once. Hmm. Salvation also is an involved process. It takes time. Over time, God is working. Jesus said that, my father have always been working. I see and I know. So I must work. Mm -hmm. I must work while it is day. Mm -hmm. But the night cometh where no man can work. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. So I stated before, salvation is a medicine word with various acts and processes. Some of which are election, adoption, reconciliation, atonement, redemption, regener regeneration, justification, imputation, sanctification, glorification, and even forgiveness of sins, forgiveness and remission of sins. This is not everything that salvation involves. Clearly, no man can know fully God's will for him. We can only know and speak about what God has revealed. The Bible does not reveal God in totality. It cannot. The Bible is a finite book in the sense that it, 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 it contains pages. It was written by man, and, it, and, and but God is more than the Bible. The, the, the Bible says plainly, the hidden things of God are the secret things of God belongs to God. But God is pleased to reveal certain truths to us. He revealed enough that we can come to him and repent from our, from our sins. He revealed the essence. It, 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 to be honest with you, grace and truth come to Jesus Christ. We are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. When we get to heaven, it's going to take God all eternity to reveal His full truth to our hearts. We will never, ever, ever come to understand God fully. We cannot. We are finite beings. God is infinite. A finite mind can never ever comprehend totally the infinite. It never will happen. Because if we could become full and perfect in all our understanding and knowledge of God, we will become like God. And that can never happen. We will always be continue and we will be continue and we will be progressing, progressing and progressing. But we will never ever reach reach omniscience. We will never ever be able to know God fully. It's going to take us all eternity and God is going to be feeling more and more, more and more of himself to us. We're going to be feeding upon him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So let's, let's look at briefly some of these aspects of salvation. And we're going to systematically deal with them as time goes by. This is just a synopsis. So we, we mentioned election. A many-sided word. Salvation is a many-sided word that gathers unto itself all the redemptive acts and processes. So election is an, it's an act of God. It deals with God choosing and predestining a people unto himself for his honor and his glory. That's all God did. God chose a people by his grace unto himself, or he elected. Elect means to choose, set apart a people unto himself. Later we're going to get into it in more detail. But in electing a people, he also elected Christ as mediator. See, we're going to say, how? Because before he can elect a people, he must, he must set apart the means. How he's going to bring it about. And Christ is the mean. So Christ was set up as mediator by grace to be our savior. 
But God elects for one reason. To bring glory and honor to himself. Amen. Adoption deals with the bestowal of sonship to those individuals who were chosen and predestined by God to be heirs and joint heirs with his son. So in the process of electing, God also elected that he would choose or he elected us to sonship. He, he, pre, he presumed or he purposed in his mind that he would make us sons. So adoption deals with sonship. And sonship has to do with being an heir. So we are we were made heirs of God and John heir with Christ. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Reconciliation deals with God making peace with his sinful people because of the atoning sacrifice of his mediatory son who shed his blood on Calvary. Reconciliation is a two-part process. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. When Christ died for our sins, we were reconciled to God. The Father must be reconciled to us first before we can be reconciled to the Father. So Christ came. Christ's primary work was to reconcile the Father to us. So Christ's work on Calvary, first and foremost, is God's work. It's towards God. He must appease God's wrath before he can, before God the Father can forgive us. The penalty of sin must be satisfied first. Hmm. So reconciliation deals with God being reconciled to us. So by his people receiving the reconciliation, preaching the gospel, and themselves being reconciled back to the Father through repentance. So when we preach the gospel, the gospel is considered to be a gospel of peace. We are reconciled back to the Father. When we, when we receive the reconciliation that the Father has for us, that is explained, or that I are revealed in the gospel, and we accept that reconciliation, and we say, Father, thank you for sending your son to die for me. I recognize that I am a sinner, and Jesus has paid a penny for my sins. Father, forgive me of my sins. So then, we are reconciled back to the Father. So reconciliation to the Father by the sinner would be the word of the Holy Spirit. When he convicts the heart of sin and you would turn from your sin and look to Jesus as the source and remedy for your sin. That's why Jesus said, if I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men unto me. When we look to him for salvation, we are saved. Because now we are actually, we are actually now receiving the reconciliation that the Father is pleased to bestow upon those ones that rely upon Christ for salvation. Amen. So it's a two-part process. God must be reconciled to us, and we must be reconciled back to God. Hmm. Now, atonement deals with Christ's atoning sacrifice when his blood was shed on the cross for the remission of his people's sin. So atone. Jesus' blood will atone. It will pay the penalty for my sins. So atonement is an act also. Hallelujah. Amen. Redemption deals with Christ's blood publicly buying his people on the marketplace who were sold under the bondage and slavery of sin. As much as you know, we have not been redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold, but we have been redeemed by the precious blood of the Lamb. Peter made this statement. What is he saying? What does it mean? We were sold into bondage and slavery of sin when Adam sinned, when Adam disobeyed God. Satan now had dominion over us. We were sold into slavery of this slavery of sin. But Jesus' blood is the one that will buy us back. Hmm. Without the shedding of blood, there can be no remission of sin. Hmm. So we were bought back publicly in the marketplace. That is why Jesus was crucified publicly. He made a show of 
of, 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 of sin. He made a show of all the ordinances that were against us openly. Colossians said that he took them and he nailed them to his cross. Amen. He nailed them. All the ordinances, all the commands that were against us. The soul has sinned, it shall die. Without the sin of blood, there will be no remission of sins. The wages of sin is death. All these artists were written against us. Command. But when Christ took upon himself the penalty for our sins and actually shed his blood and he, he nailed those things to the cross and we are free. We have been declared free. He, he brought us back. Now we are not our own. We belong to Christ. We belong to God. We are God's. We're not our own. Because he purchased us with his blood that was shed on Calvary. So redemption deals with that past aspect of salvation. Hmm. Regeneration deals with the quickening power of the Holy Spirit as he confers spiritual life on the sinner as he accept Christ as his Savior and become a new creation in Christ Jesus. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 17 If any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. Hmm. All things are passed away, all things become new. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So, regeneration involves the quickening power of the Holy Spirit. Because we were dead in trespasses and sin. Ephesians says, Ephesians 2 1 says, And you that were dead in trespasses and sin have you quickened? Have you we, we regenerated? Have you given life? We are given spiritual life by the power of the Holy Spirit. When we accept Christ as Savior. Because we are dead. Hmm. We have no knowledge of God. We don't have no desire for God. We have no love for God. But when Christ died. And the penalty for our sins was paid. God can now send the Holy Spirit to regenerate us. Regenerated by the, by the, by the Holy Spirit. And we regenerate by the word. We wash in the water by the word. Hmm. Regenerates us. Regeneration. In the plan of salvation precedes justification. Justification and regeneration actually happen at the same time. But one in the nature of things must precede the other. Just like the, when we say the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, even though they all are three and they all agree and they are one, we normally mention the Father first. So when we, when we consider salvation, we must be, be considered Regeneration before we consider justification. But they happen together. Instantaneously. It's the, they are both acts of God. That happen simultaneously. Now we're going to look at justification. Justification deals with the legal side of salvation. There's a, there's a penalty for sin. And it's death. Before God can apply the blood or the work of Jesus Christ to our hearts, the penalty must be paid. God cannot just overlook sin and say, you are righteous. He mm. has to follow the legal aspect of salvation. Salvation, as I said, is a many-sided facet, a word that is many-sided. You can look at it from all points. And in every point, it must be just. It must be upright. It must be spotless. It must be without blemish. So when it is to try and test it, there cannot be any weak points in it. Because if that is so, it will fall apart. Hmm. Especially under the condemnation of Satan and sin. So, so, so God had to deal with every aspect of salvation to make it complete and whole. So, justification will deal with the legal side of salvation. Justification, justification, like reconciliation, is two part in nature. Justification both expatiate and propitiate. Expatiation is manual, it stores us. Or, it blasts out, it covers, it removes sin. So, Jesus' blood can cleanse us. From all unrighteousness. Mm. Jesus' blood covers our sin. Jesus' blood blasts out our sin. Jesus' blood removes our sin. So that's what expatiation means. That's what expatiate means. To remove, 
to cover, to block out. But he's also the propitiator for our sins. So he expatiates and he propitiates. While propitiation is towards God, expatiation is towards man, but propitiation is Godward, towards God. Because Christ must not only block out our sins, Christ must not only remove our sins, but he must also do something else. He must satisfy the just demand of justice. Justice say the wages of sin is dead. The law says the soul that sinned it shall die. The father says that if you sin, you shall surely die. So God's wrath, God, God's anger, God's determination to deal and punish sin must be dealt with. So Christ propitiates the Father. He doesn't propitiate us. His probation is still with the Father. He's meant, his death is meant to appease the Father's wrath. So, it, so when God, when Christ's blood was shed to pay the penalty for my sins, the wrath of God was appeased and satisfied. He was now free to freely forgive my sins because the legal penalty for sin has been satisfied. Justification makes us right or righteous in God's sight. Justification also does something else. It confers citizenship or the right to heaven and the believer. When we believe in Jesus Christ as our Savior, we are given the right or the right to heaven. It is our citizenship. It is, it is a means by which we can now approach God in heavenly realm because our sins have been paid for. We have been reconciled. We have been justified. We have been atoned for. Our sins have been atoned for. We have been redeemed. We have gone through the process of election. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So now, having therefore been justified by faith, we have peace, peace with God. God. There's no more anger, righteous anger, or wrath of God exhibited or shown forth towards us. That's why we are at peace. Hallelujah. Amen. But something else is also happening. Hallelujah in justification. Mm -hmm. It deals with the sinners standing in opposition. So when we when he gives us citizenship, it deals with our standing. What is your standing? You know, like in immigration, they're gonna ask, what is your legal standing? Mm -hmm. Are you a citizen? Are you a legal resident? Are you uh they say use the term something illegal alien? That is your standing. Do you have rights hmm. to live and reside in the in the country legally? Hmm. It's a legal question. So, do you have the right to live in heaven? Is what justification would, would answer. Yes, you do. Because you have been justified by faith. And when God justify you, none can condemn you. Who is there to condemn? Hallelujah. It is God that justifies. Hmm. Hallelujah. So it's dealing with your standing or your position. Your position in Christ is that you have been justified. You have been reconciled. You are a new creation. You are a brand new man. That is, your, that, is your, that is your position. Now, something else also happens. Hallelujah. Amen. So justification deals externally with us. It, is, it deals with our external nature. Because it, it, it bestows a robe of righteousness to us. Hallelujah. Amen. Making us right for heaven. We have the right to heaven. Justification gives us a robe of righteousness. Justification imputes or bestows Christ's righteousness to us. Hallelujah. Christ takes our sin and then he imputes or he bestows his righteousness to us. So now we are we are legal, legally free from sin, mm -hmm. and we have received Christ's righteousness. So now we can stand in God's presence as righteous individuals. So now imputation deals with the act of God imputing Christ's righteousness to us because we believe in Jesus Christ as our Savior. 
So when we believe in Jesus Christ and we are justified by faith, God imputes or bestows Christ's righteousness to us. Hallelujah. Amen. Because we believe in Christ. Imputation and justification is also two part in nature. It's a two part work of God. Hallelujah. Not only is Christ's righteousness imputed to us when we believe in him as our Savior, but our sins are in turn imputed to him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. As he came to bear the burden and pay the penalty for, for our sin. By imputation, God sees us as completely sinless and righteous. As hmm. justification deal with the old man, so sanctification deal with the inner and inward man. They are both necessary work of God. As together they make us both right, uh, righteous and holy before God. Without sanctification, no man can see God. But I must say, without holiness, no one, no man can see the Lord. So we need to be holy. Be ye holy, for I am holy. So sanctification is a tool or the method through which God makes us holy. And it is by the word of God. It is by the washing of the water, by the word. The word is a tool that God used to make us holy. Hallelujah. Amen. By the power of the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. So they are both, this is the work of God together, as they make us both righteous and holy before God, conferring on us both standing and state, a righteous position and a holy condition. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank God for that. Amen. The first doctrine that we will be looking at is the doctrine of election. Amen. Hallelujah. The doctrine of election. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. For when God made promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no greater, he swore by himself, saying, Surely blessing I will bless thee, and multiplying I will multiply thee. Mm -hmm. And so, after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. For men verily swear by the greater, and oath for confirmation is to them an end of all strife. Mm -hmm. When God, willing more abundantly to show unto us, or unto the heirs of the promise, the immutability of his counsel, confirm it by an oath. That by two immutable things, in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entereth in into that within the veil. Whether or whether the forerunner is for us entered, even Christ, even Jesus, made an high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Now we can also look at Romans chapter 9, verse 20 to 26. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So Hebrews and Romans 9, 20 to 26. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Nay, but, O man, who art thou that thou replies against God? Shall the thing farm say to him that farm it, Why hast thou made me thus? Has not the potter over the clay, has not the potter power over the clay, of the same lump, to make one vessel unto honor, and another unto dishonor? What if God will to show his wrath, and to make his power known, enduring us long suffering the vest of wrath fitted to destruction, and that he might make known the riches of his glory and the vessel of mercy, which he had afore prepared unto glory, even us, whom we have called, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. And he said also in Hosea, I will call them my people, which were not my people, 
and her beloved which was not beloved. And it shall come to pass that in the place where it was said unto them, Ye are not my people, they shall be called the children of the living God. Hallelujah. Amen. Now the word the word election comes from a Greek word. Elogie. E K L O G E. Elogie. It means a picking out. Or it means a choosing. It is translated chosen in Acts 9.15. Acts 9.15. But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me, to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. In six other places in the New Testament, it is trans translated election. Hallelujah. Six other places in, in the... New Testament, this word ekloje is translated, it means election. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. In the first instant, it is found in Romans 9 11. Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. Romans chapter 9, verse 11. Hallelujah. Amen. For the children, being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him that calleth, it was said unto her, The elder shall serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. What shall we say then? Is there a rightness with God? God forbid. For I said to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So then, it is not of him that willeth, now he that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. Hmm. God spoke and he and he gave some examples that he loved Jacob, but he hated Esau. So election is a choosing, a choice. God is sovereign. He can choose whom he wills. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Also, let's look at Romans eleven, verse five. Romans 11, 5. Hallelujah. Amen. Even so, then at this present time, also, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. At this present time, speaking about the truth of Israel, mm -hmm. there is a, a remnant that God will, by election, mm -hmm. because election deals with the past, eternity past. Election is a work of God in eternity past. Hallelujah. But his purpose, God, his purpose, he still has a plan for Israel. There's still a remnant that will be saved. Hmm. Even though they are walking contrary now, but because of the election of grace, he promised that he made to his son and to, and to Abraham, he will bring them to himself at some point in time. Hallelujah. Amen. Also verse 7, um, Romans 11, 7. What then? Israel have not obtained that which he seeketh. For, but the election have obtained it. And the rest were blended. So again, a remnant. Some were chosen. We have been elected. We have been chosen. We have been called out. Hmm. We have received the election. It has been manifested in us. But some of Israel have not as yet seen it. Seen the work. Seen the work in Action. Let's look at First Thessalonians chapter one verse four. Hallelujah. Amen. First Thessalonians chapter one verse four. Amen. Knowing, brethren, beloved, your election of God. For our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power, and in the Holy Ghost, and in much assurance, as you know what manner of men we were among you for your sake. So we all know, we should know our, our election is by God, or is of God. And the last scripture is 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 10. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 10. It says, Wherefore, the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you shall never fall. 
Hallelujah. Amen. So since God exists before man, his eternal purposes long preceded his working time. God is eternal and he existed long before man. But his eternal purpose preceded his work in time. God planned something and purposed something before he actually brought it about in time. So election, as I said, deals with eternity past. God in eternity past chose a people for himself. He was pleased to choose a people for himself. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And the last scripture we're going to read in this session is Act 15, verse 18. Because I said that God existed before man. And his eternal purpose, or his eternal plan, or his eternal decree, preceded his work. Before God does anything, he plans, he purposes. It's in his mind. Hallelujah. So Acts 15, 18 says this. Hallelujah. Acts 15, verse 18. Known unto God are all his work from the beginning of the world. Everything that God does, he knows. It, he knows it before the beginning of the world, or even from the foundation of the world. He knows everything beforehand because he purposes it. He plans it. Hmm. So election is a plan and a purpose of God that deals with how he's going to Save us. The cause, the means, the end result, the plan, all the intricate details, who would be saved, why we, why we would be saved, who's going to pay the price for our sin, what is the penalty for sin, all these things were purposing and determined by God beforehand.